recall the check there, the Psalm number 40, verses 1 through 5. The Psalm starts, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry log, set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell them, yet they are more than can be told. God's Word calls us to live in a state of patient urgency. And that's a difficult thing to do to get the two things lined up. Patient urgency. There's an urgency about things, but we have to be patient about them. Now, a good example of that, if you remember a number of years ago, and I forget just how long ago it was, it might have been while we were still living in Ohio, there's a little girl that fell into a well in Midland, Texas. In, in the 80s, I'm pretty sure it was. So you're talking, that's at least 30 years ago that this happened. And national news TV stations, one of the biggest events that had happened on there just about all the time. And, you know, they chose to, I believe, come down, uh, drill another well, and then come in horizontally kind of underneath her to get her. But one of the things that they were uh, telling her constantly was don't move. Stay still. We'll get you out. But that, that was a little girl that they were talking to that had fallen in that well. And they, they were afraid that if she moved around too much, she'd fall further down that well. And that well may have been 5,000 feet deep or whatever. Who, who knows? So when we're looking at this lesson, this patient urgency, you kind of think about this. And there's an urgency to get this work completed to get that girl out of there, but yet they're calling on her to be patient, and they have to have a patience in their voice to kind of get her to the point where she can have trust in them. And, and you notice in that reading, the word trust appears right kind of in the middle. Now, one of my favorite favorite sayings, idioms, just one of those things that that you kind of rely upon in life is that we need to pray like everything depends upon God and work like everything depends upon us. Now a lot of people like to do the first one, pray like everything depends upon God, then just let God handle it, you know, but you know, the second part of that's important because if we're not actively trying to bring into fruition that which we are petitioning God for, uh, he might not think that we are really sincere about what we're asking for. So it's like, you know, somebody might be saying, you know, God, you know, I wish I had a million dollars. Would God, will you give me a million dollars? But you're not out there working like you need a million dollars and trying to get the million dollars, well, what, why would God help? Now, I'm not saying that we should be praying for a million dollars or even working for a million dollars, but using that just as kind of an example. But the patient urgency, when we put things in God's hands, that doesn't mean we cease to try to make those things come to pass. There are some things we can't do anything about, but there are other things, and most of the things in life, and many of the things that we're dealing with God in our salvation for, there are things we need to be doing. Because God is watching, and God is seeing how serious we are. Now, as 
David, I believe, wrote this, and he begins the psalm as one is trapped in a watery pit, right? And he's down in the mud, at the bottom, and he's kind of sinking. He, he can't get out. You know, if you get stuck in the mud, you, you need help. And that's what he's saying. He needs somebody. He's waiting on somebody to rescue him. But he's not really talking about a physical situation being trapped in the mud. He's talking about being in sin. And, and, and he needs to be rescued from that sin. And we know that God doesn't rescue every sinner from the bondage of sin and death. He doesn't even rescue every sinner who simply asks him, God, please forgive me. There are things that have to happen that the individual has to do. We know that a person, if he asks, wants forgiveness, he has to come into covenant relationship with God. Uh, he has to do those things. He has to have repentance. He has, he has to have faith. He has to re have repentance. And, and in our time, there has to be that confession of Jesus Christ, baptism for the forgiveness of the sins. All those things are essential. It's just not a, a you know, put it in God's hands, you know. Name it and claim it. Well, God grants his blessing of salvation to those who put their trust in him. And that putting trust in him means what we've talked about on Sunday mornings in the sermons in the last three weeks where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Trusting in Jesus means not only do we ask him for salvation, but we actually put ourselves in his hands for that salvation by doing the things that would bring us into a right relationship with him. So how can we know that we are putting trust in God? How, what does God expect of us when he asks us to trust him? And what must we do to show trust in God? That's basically the setup for the, the sermon this evening. Trust in God demands our obedience to his commandments. Plain and simple. If, if we trust God, we have to trust his commandments. Especially those ones that are for us under the present covenant. Psalm 40, verse 6. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted. That's David speaking about God. But you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. But wait a minute. I thought that was a, a, a commandment under the law of Moses. Well, yes it was, but, but you've got to go back and look at what David is talking about here. God's people must dwell in a state of moral uprightness. And what David is trying to express here is that just showing up for the services, just taking the sheep or the bull or the goat or whatever to the tabernacle or the temple and having it sacrificed and paying the tithes in no way makes up for living a moral lifestyle, an upright, a righteous lifestyle. It, it didn't work for them back un, under the old covenant, and such things won't work for us today. Uh, a lot of people attend services to get the mark that, hey, I was in attendance, I was there, God must be happy with me. And that's not quite the way that God looks at it. Yes, we should be there. We should be in attendance, but uh, that does us no good in the absence of moral uprightness. The law of God is an expression of his holiness, according to Psalm 145, verse 17. The law of God. That tells us what separates God from us and it also tells us what will separate us from the world. It's God's law. Now, that happened for them, and the law that we are under today, the law of Christ, tells us how we can be separated from a fallen world. And that's how we would gain or be accounted by God as righteous and living a righteous life, a life of moral uprightness. 
sacrifice for sin is an expression of God's grace. Catch that? Sacrifice for sin is an expression of God's grace. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Remember what that says? The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Maybe paraphrasing that a little bit at the end, but here's the key. Sacrifice for sin is an expression of God's grace. Now we'll deal with that in a moment. But sacrifice for sin is something we do, but it's not something of ourselves. Think about that for a moment. Christ's sacrifice for all mankind's sin is an expression of God's love. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, or only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So there's that grace aspect of it, but also the love aspect of it. And isn't that an expression of God's holiness also? Now, you can trust somebody who loves you and somebody who's willing to sacrifice for you, right? Sure. How about somebody who tells you the right way to live? Like the kind of way of life, the truth and the life. <laughs> you know, no one comes to the Father, but by, man, can we trust Jesus? Well, I, I think we can. I think you would agree. But here, sacrifice for sin is a secondary issue in our efforts to be morally upright. Secondary issue. He said, what do you mean? Fred, did, did you just preach here not too long ago that, that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his shedding of the blood, was the essential redemption? Well, yes, but for you and me, it's kind of a secondary issue. And I'm going to explain why. Okay? God accepts sacrifice and offering to cover sin. Especially he did in the Old Testament, right? But God would rather that we don't sin, period. He'd rather that we don't sin. Now, because Adam and Eve sinned, and everybody else who came along after them, who lived to an age of accountability and had dealings with God, sinned. And you know what? They needed a Savior. But the Savior wasn't going to come for a while, so God gave them sacrifices and offerings to, we say, cover the sin. But really what God did was pass over the sin until Christ came to shed his blood upon the cross. So it was really kind of a secondary issue because what did God want? He wants people to live morally upright lives. He wants us to live righteously. Now David learned not to make the same mistake as King Saul. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. You remember what happened there? Uh, Saul was waiting on Samuel to come and offer sacrifice because they were going to war. Samuel didn't come, didn't come, didn't come. So what did Saul do? King Saul offered a sacrifice. And just as soon as he starts offering that sacrifice, who shows up? <laughs> Samuel. Well, what do you think you're doing? You're not supposed to do that. But, but, but we're going into battle. But what's the title of the lesson tonight? Patient urgency. We're, we're, we're going into the battle. We're, we're going in. This needed to be done. And then the people were clamoring. And you said, no. Should have waited. Should have been patient just a little bit longer. See, it's, it all ties in, doesn't it? But David learned that lesson from there. Psalm 50, verse 7 through 17. Rather long. But it explains this concept about sacrifice. Who, who is sacrifice for? Now, if you're dealing with the heathen nations, the idolaters, they're saying their sacrifice is for the gods that they're sacrificing to, right? Because the gods have to eat. And the gods need this and the gods need that. But what about God? What about our God, our 
God in heaven who is spirit being. Hear, O oh my people, and I will speak, O oh Israel. I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. It's not because you're giving sacrifices. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I see you doing it. Look what he says in verse 9. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your foes. For every beast of the forest is... Who? It's God's. But when we make a sacrifice, if we're not giving ourselves, what are we doing? We're just giving God back something that's already given us. And the only reason we can say we're giving God a sacrifice for giving Him ourselves is because He gave us free will. Let's go on with this. For every bird of the forest, the beast of the forest is mine, the cattle of a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. You're just give me back my stuff that I'm letting you use. If I were hungry, verse 12, I wouldn't tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. In other words, when you say, God, I'm going to do this for you, you know what you ought to do? Do it. Do it. That's performing the vow. Verse 15, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. Wow! That's powerful, isn't it? That, 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 that's like the, the two-edged sword that's mentioned in the book of Hebrews, right? That cuts right to the chase of what God wants. So sacrifice and burnt offerings, those things weren't to, to for God's benefit or man's benefit. And there's so many things that we are called upon to do in worship that really aren't for God's benefit for our benefit to draw us closer to God. God used the sacrifices and offerings to teach man about the destructive nature of sin. To explain what death is and what failure to have a right relationship with God brings to human beings. Trust in God demands fulfilling our duties to work with Him. Yeah, we've got duties. Duties toward our God. Psalm 40 and verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. This is quoted in the book of Hebrews, isn't it? It's quoted in the book of Hebrews about, excuse me, about Christ. About Christ coming to be a sacrifice for our sins. So, <coughs> excuse me, two applications have been offered for David's relationship to this verse. David's personal relationship to this verse. Number one, a fulfillment of the prophecy about a king's desire to serve. And I mentioned this a little bit this morning in Bible class. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 and 15. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that's the king of Israel, of the king of God's people, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved to be 
with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord. I'm oh, sorry, I jumped down. Okay. When you come to the land the Lord your God has given you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose, one from whom among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Have you ever heard anybody say, God didn't want Israel to have a king over you? I've heard people say that all my life. I've heard church members say that all my life. I think I've heard preachers say that all my life. What does what does God say? God says you're going to want a king, and you have one, but it's going to be one of your, one from your brethren and not a foreigner. And how many times have I mentioned it in what five and a half years? A little over almost six years now. How many times about King Herod? How that a, a ruler from David's household ruled over Israel and Judah after the division of the kingdoms, clear down to the time of King Herod, who was an Edomian. And that was a sign that the Messiah was coming that first time. There's more proof of it. Okay? Now, back to the king. He was to copy, carry, and follow the law. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 18 and 20. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of the law, approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him. He shall read it all the read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and, and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. And all you have to do is start from 1 Samuel when Saul is anointed king and ruled and go through and you can find the good kings and the bad kings. And you'll find there were more bad kings than there were good kings. And the reason they were bad kings is probably right here. They didn't obey the law. They did not respect the law of God. So there's that, that uh, need to, to uh, fulfill the duties. And, and there was a primary duty, a primary duty. Get in the Word of God. And, and that's one of the ways that we can learn to trust God. The Hebrew writer made this passage applicable, applicable to Jesus in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4 through 7. And it says, the word says about opening his ear. Now that comes from Exodus chapter 21, verses 2 through 6. Pierce my ear or open my ear. That was if he had a slave. Remember, if a slave was a, a Hebrew, if one Hebrew had another Hebrew as a slave, like an indentured servant, he could only keep him for like seven years. And after the seventh year, he got to go free. But if he had been given a wife and given, and they had children, they stayed with the master. Now, if the slave said, you know, I'm happy being a slave. You're a good master. I always want to be with you. Take him over to the doorpost and cut a chunk out of his ear. Or some would say maybe put an earring in. We don't know fully just what it was. But what that would represent is He's going to remain a slave to that master for the rest of his life by choice. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was being a slave to God as a human being. The Word became flesh, but as a human being, he's 
he makes himself a servant slave to God the Father. And he does the Father's will. But as a slave, a body you have prepared for me. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5, God gave the word a body, a body to sacrifice for our sins. Isn't that amazing how God did that? Not a bull, not a goat, not some animal, a human body. A human body. The body of Jesus of Nazareth, who is Christ. And so when we look at this and we're talking about trust, and we say, I have come to do your will, O God, That's really where it gets down to this point of trust. I have come to do, I have come to do your will. And that's a point of where we have to continually grow and grow and grow. Grow away from self, grow away from the world, and grow closer to God. Where everything that we are becomes God. Not everything that we have, that's already God's. But everything that we are. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Really, that should be spiritual service. There's a difference between worship and service. I think the English Standard Version got it wrong there, as does, I think, the NIV and a few others. But that's our spiritual service toward our God, is to give of ourselves as Christ gave himself for us. Trust in God demands our commitment to his eternal world view. We trust God's eternal world view. Psalm 40, verse 8 through 10, so it's picking back up in verse 8, going on through 10. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have restrained, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Yeah, that just destroys the people who talk about like they're, they're silent disciples or silent Christians, you know. Well, I, I just go and I sit in the pew, but I, I'm faithful, you know. And it's, you know, there, there's something to be done here. And there's a commitment to a world view. And if we're not teaching somebody about this world view, then we're not really doing what God would have us to do. And that's it, it, it starts with family and it goes to friends and then it blossoms from there with every opportunity that God gives to us. This is a philosophical and practical commitment to New Testament Christianity. And I know there are some people that hate the sound of that. It just New Testament Christianity is a philosophy? No, but in our minds, the philosophical soundness of Christianity, New Testament Christianity, that we can fight for it like it's a philosophy, like people fight for utilitarianism, like they fight for communism. You know, if we're not engaged in a fight against communism and Marxism right now, they're going to win. 
they're going to win in America. Okay? So what are we going to fight with? Capitalism? Well, capitalism is just an economic policy, right? But you put everything together, the greatest thing to fight against communism and Marxism with is what's called the test of Christianity. So if we want to be engaged in the fight, that's what we have to use as a weapon. And that's where we get that at. Well, that's the sword of God, isn't it? The word is the sword of God. But it's philosophical and it's practical. That means that we live by it, we practice it. Our commitment to learning, memorizing, and living according to the scripture what Jesus taught, what the apostles taught. Those things never grow old. They're general principles. They're general enough to apply in any age, in any culture. And they're good. And there's things even in the Old Testament that are good for us. Okay? Doesn't mean that we're under the Old Testament. But there are things that we can know. We know it's wrong to murder, shed innocent blood. We know it's wrong to bear false witness. Well, at least most of us do. Some people out here in America don't anymore. But 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God that sounds like a sacrifice situation, right? Present yourself like you're the sacrifice. Present you, yourself, to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Handle it rightly. I know people that don't handle it rightly. They quote something, quote it out of context, just like the devil did when he was tempting Jesus. It's up to us to correct them. Now, they may not be corrected, but remember, the third person might be standing there to listen and say, you know, I, 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 I kind of agree there with Fred that, that, that that's what the Bible really said. And maybe agree with you, too. It's not always the person that we're debating with. It's the person who's listening. The person will go and open up their Bible and look at it and study it. But that becomes important. It's a commitment to living and teaching righteousness according to verse 9 from Psalm 40. In Acts chapter 10, or I'm sorry, Acts chapter 17, verse 30 31, Paul, the apostle, when he's talking to the philosophers on Mars Hill, talks about the can I say this, put it in air quotes, philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth, right? <laughs> That's what he's doing, isn't it? When he's talking to them, he's, he's using it as a philosophy. He's using the gospel as a philosophy to, to talk to philosophers. And, and he says, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That's how we have that assurance. God raised him from the dead. So we know that it's true. We know that we can trust Jesus Christ. He has authority because of that. The third point is that, he, that there's a commitment to sharing the gospel, and that comes from verse 10 of, of uh, Psalm 40. Uh, we got the Great Commission. I don't know who called it the Great Commission, but you know what? Couldn't call it anything better. The greatest commission, maybe. 
but it's the Great Commission. Go to all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. That's the task. Now, then it all falls on whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Our task is to preach the gospel. Whoever hears it, they've got to make a choice whether to believe it or not. So our task, you know, we're not going to be judged on whether they believe it or not. We're going to be judged on whether we teach it or not. Yeah, that, that makes it easy on us. It's not who we say, it's that we actually made the attempt. So, conclusion. David begins his psalm by saying he waited patiently, but he ends by asking God to come to his rescue without delay. It's a patient urgency, right? You see it working. i got to wait, but God, hurry up. Time, time's wasting. David trusted that God would save him because David lived a life of trust in God. God, I know, I know you're going, God, I know you're going to save the faithful. God, I'm living my life the best I can to, to, to please you, to serve you. God, save me. Give me a little time. The work's not over. It's kind of like the Apostle Paul, right? You know, he, he's, he's at that point where, uh, what does he say? You know, if, if I live, it's if I die, it's for, for Christ. And it's my benefit, I get to go on. But if I live... You know, I get to serve God a little bit longer, get to preach a little bit longer. What a beautiful thing. And that's kind of like where David is. David had such a huge task in front of him in ruling God's people, Israel, the Old Testament. You know, God will save us if we live a life of trust in the peace. That's how we prove our trust. And that's why God wants to see us. That's what we want to Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Maybe I should have started there. <laughs> but half an hour ago. Thank you for your time.